All right. Good afternoon. Welcome back. See some of you I can see joining in from the last session. And to those of you that are new here, my name is Johan, and I will be your host for the next hour or so in here. As I said in my previous session, I've been doing deployment for a very long time, uh, 21 years now. I started when I was in high school, or the equivalent of high school, and I used to go down to a local computer shop after school and help them assemble computers, and of course they had to be deployed. So that's how I started, and I've been doing that ever since. I love questions, so throughout the sessions, if you have any questions whatsoever, feel free to just raise your hand or yell them out, and I will be happy to answer them. I try to, on this machine, monitor the Twitter feed as well from the Nick conference, so if you post questions on that one, I might catch them unless it's going too fast there. Uh, normally, they would have a Twitter feed for every single session, but they don't, so I'll try to monitor the main feed instead. If you need to uh, contact me after the sessions, if you have any questions whatsoever, feel free to, to find me on Twitter or on my blog, or as I said, I have a pretty unique last name. You will find me if you are pretty savvy on doing some internet searches. Okay. This is um, my, pr how many of you actually attended my previous session? I recognize some of you. Well, 25% uh, or so, okay. Um, on the NIC conference, there are three sessions. The one I did before this one, an hour ago, was the broad session, where we discussed all the tools available to us in Windows 8. This session is deeping, diving deep on the, the setup engine alone, and also a little bit on where it fits into the overall process that Microsoft has with, uh, in terms of deployments. So, how many of you are deploying Windows 7 today? A good few of you. Likely, you don't have to learn that much, because imaging in Windows 8 it's working pretty much the same with way it does with Windows 7. So if you already invested the time going from XP to Windows 7, you are way on your way, way ahead to step up with Windows 8 deployments. If you're going from XP to Windows 8, be prepared for a, I wouldn't say world of pain, but a challenge because things are changing a lot between XP and Windows 8. So, in Windows 8, we still have uh, image-based setup. That's the way we do deployment these days. Most of you have done that for like 15 years already, but in Windows 8 timeframe, everything is image-based. If you download the Windows 8 DVD, crank open it, you go to the sources folder, you will find two images. One boot.wim file, that's your WinP4 boot image, and you will find the install WIM, which is the Windows 8 image in it. It's a sys prepped image by Microsoft ready for deployment. Meaning, as with Windows 7, we don't have to create reference images, even though you normally do to save some deployment time, but we don't have to anymore. It's in there already. But what we'll see now in the Windows 8 timeframe is support for new types of hardware new types of architectures. We will see ARM devices. That's why we still have 32-bit things in Windows, I think. x86 and x64 will still be available, but we won't only see laptops these days. We will see the new Ultrabooks, you know, those seven or eight millimeters thin laptops. We will see Slate devices, Galaxies, and all these new notepads being available, and they need to be deployed as well the same way. They will probably be deployed by an OEM, but as an enterprise organization, you can do that too. Now, the setup still needs to run on the right environment. Meaning, if you want to deploy a 64-bit image, you still need to run the 64-bit version of the setup if you want to run setup. If you need to deploy a 32-bit image, and you want to run the setup for it, you need to run the 32-bit setup. 
But that's just the default way the setup works. What we can do, and what we have been able to do since Vista Service Pack 1, is that I can launch the 64-bit setup and tell it to deploy a 32-bit image doing cross-platform deployments. And the same thing I can do to a 32-bit image and do the same thing here. Or I can use other tools. I can use DISM now, command line utilities, to apply images. This is something you cannot do in Windows 7. You have to use ImageX, but now we can use it with DISM directly. We can automate everything, as you probably know. But in the XP days, we used to have a rich set of answer files, depending on what we did. If I wanted to do a scripted setup of XP, I run an attempt text with all the setup information. If I wanted to prepare an image, I would have a sysprep INF file. When I deploy that image, I also had a sysprep INF file that I used to add computer information, domain join information, OU, and things like that. And we used to have a WinBOM INI file in Windows PE that allowed us to do partitioning and stuff in WinPE. In Windows 8, all these different answer files is being combined into one single file, the unattend XML file, where you will see some new entries showing up for Windows 8 that was not available in, in Windows 7. But it still works the same way. Now in the unattend XML file, we have different sections. Meaning, depending on what the setup is doing currently, we need to put the information in the correct setting, in the correct section, or as it says, or it's named, pass. Otherwise, the setup won't find it. For example, language settings. If you want to have the bookmall keyboard layout, NV-NO, I think it is, that can be added into three different places into the answer file we used for deployment, and you need to know which one, depending on what type of deployment you do. In the previous session, I talked about boot from VHD. In this session, I will show it to you, how we can create this. How many of you are running boot from VHD today? Not many. Three persons, three people. Boot from VHD is something that will change and be more um, commonly used in the Windows 8 time frame. It's just a very neat way of deploying Windows. Now, what you do is that you create a VHD container using this part or disk manager. I will show you this later. You take the image that you have and you dump it into that container, into that file. So now I have a single file my win8.vhd file, which is the, the whole operating system in a single file. I can take that file, copy to a machine, and boot from it. It's not a virtual machine. I'm still booting out of physical hardware. But it's a single file. Really useful, for example, for Hyper-V hosts. How difficult is it if the hardware breaks to transfer the OS to new hardware? Well, I need to figure out a way to copy a file from one machine to another. It's not that difficult. If you have SANS, you can do boot from SAN, or you can have the VHD data in a SAN, make it very easy to transfer information very quickly to a device. That is something that boot from VHD enables. And one more thing. In Windows 8, as I said in the previous session, we have Windows to go. You can do that with Windows 7 currently. It's just not supported. Windows to go means you take that VHD file, but instead of copying it to a machine hard drive, you copy it to a USB stick. And you have your entire Windows 8 setup. Your image, your machine is on that USB stick. And you can take that to any hardware available and boot it from it. And there are really cool USB sticks uh, being uh, made available for you uh, the next few months. My demo environment here, I'm, I'm quite proud of. I have 1.2 terabyte 
of solid state drives on a laptop. That's pretty much. But that allows me to run multiple VMs frequently. There are now appearing USB sticks that are based on solid state chips. And with USB 3, which a modern laptop will have, we have a 5 gigabit throughput per second. Meaning, running Windows 8 from a USB 3 solid state will be about five times faster than any normal drive on a machine would. Of course, if you have a solid state, you will have the same performance, but solid state as a USB ship with pretty cool technology emerging, and Windows 8 supports it. That's one of the changes that Microsoft does. Also, like Windows 7, we don't have to worry about HAL replacement anymore. For those of you still deploying XP, you know it can be uh, quite challenging to deal with different HAL versions that needs to be available when you deploy that image to you. And quite frankly, to be supported by Microsoft, you're not really supposed to have a single image, even though most of you have. It just works, but it's just not supported. In Windows 8 it is. And you don't have to use the new version of Windows P to deploy Windows 8. You can have your current WinP version from the current Windows 8 kit to deploy Windows 8 as well. The MDT 2012 beta can deploy together with the Windows Icon version 3 of WinP the Windows 8 developer preview as is. There will be an RC made available in late February for MDT that will allow you to deploy the Windows 8 beta that will be available in late February as well. Hopefully, we're looking for a release of Windows 8 this fall. Uh, I had heard dates from ranging from August to October, so I will just say second half of 2012. But there will be a beta in February of Windows 8, and there will be tools that you can deploy it with. All right. So, I mentioned briefly in the, to the previous slide that we can run setup, but we can also run ImageX. We can also run DISM to apply an image with Windows 8. And the benefit of doing an ImageX and DISM apply is it's a little bit faster than running the setup. And we can also do more advanced configurations before applying that DISM file running, uh, compared with running the setup. So setup is a bit slower, but we can still use sequences, engines to control the behavior uh, when we apply those images. So let me go to a machine where I happen to have a, uh, not you, um, here. A leftover from my previous demo. So I will go to the VM. And I will capture the uh, Windows 7, uh, Windows 7, <laughs> Windows 8 ISO. Uh, Windows 8. And I will do the 64 bit one. And I will boot from it. It's now booting WinP version 4. It's booting it from the boot WIM file in the sources folder on the ISO. And uh, very shortly, it will give me a sort of a setup environment ready. Setup XE has not started yet, but we do have an environment running right now. And like Windows 7, anytime you have this environment running, you can get access to uh, things behind it. Because you can press Shift F10 to get a command prompt. How long has this, has, been, uh, has this been available to you in deployments? This Shift F10 thing to get a command prompt. Can I, can I have a guessing of years? Since this is a guess, do we have any additional guess, guesses? About 16 years. The feature came with NT4. Remember NT? Build on NT. Anytime the setup UI is running, you can do this. 
You can prevent it by creating a tag file, but by default it's enabled. So, for example, this is the X drive, and I will just adjust the coloring a little bit for the uh, people in the back row here. And the layout to fit 8 by 600. And a color to make me feel good. Right. Looks like that when I started. So if I go to my Windows folder, I will have the setup act log file. This is the main log file for the Windows 8 setup. And as we can see here, we'll just adjust the font a little bit. It tried to figure out if we booted from a CD or from a Pixie, and we are basically we are good to go. So I will go back, I will hit next, and I will click install now. And this is where the point where setup XE is actually running. So I will flip back to my command prompt. I will review the log file again. And I will wait because it will put a screen over it in a second. Here we go. And you can see it, it has added a few more lines to the setup. For example, you can see it's actually started setup XE with a bunch of undocumented switches. They are there, but they're just not documented. Like Windows 7, by the way. So anyway, I will go back here. I will accept my license. I will uh, do a custom deployment, and I will select my drive. And deployment will start. It will copy the 312 megs of setup files, and then shortly it will start expanding the WIM file to the drive. Right. So if I go back to my drive, I go to my C drive, which is now being created for me, and I will do a directory listing, listing all hidden files as well. And as with Windows 7, I would get nothing. Yet, setup is currently expanding 2%. Where is my stuff? Any guesses? Let's take a look. Let's start this part. Let's do a list volume. And you can see that the C drive is the new 350 meg in size BitLocker partition. In Windows 7 it was 100. But you can see the E drive is where my Windows is because it has a page file and it's big. So if I go to my E drive, this is where it's currently expanding uh, Windows to it. And now you can see a change in Windows 8 compared with Windows 7. There is one folder in here that is different compared with Windows 7. That's Documents and Settings folder the junction point to it. In Windows 7, it was pointed to a D drive. Because in their infinite wisdom, when Microsoft built Windows 7 images in Redmond, they deployed them to a D drive, and they captured it from a D drive. So if you took that image and deployed it directly with Config Manager, Windows ended up on the D drive. Now it will end up on the C drive, which is good. So, but now I can go into this folder, and into the Panther folder, and now the setup log file has been uh, continuously growing in here, so I can still follow my setup. And now, for example, if I search for memory, and I can type correctly, you can see the system apparently has enough memory because a gig is obviously more than 376. So Windows 8 has the exact same requirement as Windows 7 does. Windows PE requires more. Don't even think about running Windows 8 on a machine with less than a gig of RAM. Offline servicing will break, big time. So most Windows 8 customers will be running a minimum of 2 gigs on 32-bit systems and a minimum of 4 gigs on 64-bit systems. The rare exception would probably be those late devices. They will probably run with a gig of memory. We'll see about that, but all right. 
So now the setup will, will run. Uh, the setup is about, in my testing at least, 30-35% faster than Windows 7. So normally I can deploy a machine within 10 minutes. It's pretty good, at least if I have a solid state drive. But um, yeah. So we just kill this one for now. <coughs> what if you want to do some customizations? What if you want to do uh, your own boot images? How do we do that in the Windows 8 timeframe? Well, you have to install the ADK to be able to create those new boot images. And the ADK is only available if you today have an MSD and subscription. But as I said, we can still use WinP version 3 to deploy Windows 8. So, fair enough. If you know how to do that, go ahead and do it. But what I will do here, I will map myself up to a uh, server where I have the ADK installed. And my super secret password. So ADK installs itself into a um, Windows Kits folder in the version 8. And this is where I have deployment. And this is where I have my WinPE, my 32 and 64 bit. And I have my media. This is the old ISO folder in Windows 7. So to create the new boot image, I simply need to copy this one to a folder somewhere. Nick WinP and paste it. Then in the media folder, I need to create a sources folder like this. So now I have the complete structure. And let me just start to zoom it here. So these are the folders you need. But we also need the WIM file. So I will go back and I will get the WIM file. I will copy it to my sources folder paste it, and I will rename it to boot.wim. That's the default boot name for the WIM file. So I've created the folder, created the sources, copied the file. Now I simply need to make it bootable. And the key to make a boot image bootable is a small boot sector. ETFSboot.com stands for El Torito File System, which is a restaurant in Irvine, California, where the uh, people who developed the standard used to have lunch. That's why they named the file etfsboot.com. It's very important to know this. Uh, but I need that file. Um, let me see. Imaging tools. Uh, So there is a new version of OS the image, and here you have the uh, etfsboot.com file. And you also have the one for uh, EFI systems as, as well. So I will copy these files, put them back here, and then I will do a command prompt. Uh, not that one. This one. I will go to that folder, and I will create a boot image. So I will run OSD in dash B and the uh, L3 to file system boot name dash N for long file name support, otherwise it will break, and the uh, uh, media folder. Outputting it to a nick.iso file. So come on to create ISO, the boot sector to make it bootable, the folder to create it from, and the ISO to actually create. And you can see it's about well under 200 megs. If I add in every single component that is available in WIMP version 4, it will be uh, well over 400 megs in size in the preview. So please be careful when you select components. It will take longer time to boot it or download over the network. So now I have an ISO. I can go to a client again. I will go to a clean snapshot. And I will boot from this ISO.
Nick Win P. I will select the ISO and the machine will boot. It will start in 1024 by 768 and then shortly it will uh, shrink itself to 8 by 600. Here we go. How do you set the screen resolution? What if you don't like 8 by 600? You have a 24 inch screen. 8 by 600 is big. How do we change this? How do we change it in Windows 7? How do we automate setup or its environment? Remember the file? I told you 15 minutes ago. The unattend XML file. If you put a well formatted unattend XML file in the root of your boot image, you can specify the screen resolution. And WinP will be happy to change it to whatever you type in here. So you only need to create that XML file and add that to your boot image as well. So anyway, I'll do the same adjustments. And I will connect to a network share. I'm just going to verify I have access to the machine. Yes, I did. So now I can go into a folder where I have my operating system copied. Um, like the developer preview, go to the sources folder and I can run setup. How many think it will work? How many think this will work? It didn't. Why? I created a 64-bit boot image. I'm trying to deploy setup from a 32-bit OS. And I started this morning by saying, if I'm starting a 64-bit boot image, I need to run the 64-bit setup. So I need to go into this 64-bit folder, sources, and now I can run setup. Right. Whoop. <laughs> See the name? Still Windows 8. Windows Developer Preview. They forgot to change that screen. So now I can start the deployment again, but now I'm running it over the network. And what I could have done, I can run setup slash install from colon, and I could specify the 32-bit image if I wanted to, or vice versa. But I'm not going to do this. I will cancel this one, and we'll create a VHD file. So currently, if I do a disk part here, I don't have any volume except my, my, my CD right now. So <coughs> first, I'm going to select my uh, only hard drive, my physical hard drive, well, in the VM, that is. And I will create the partition on it. And I will format it. The NTFS file system, I'll do it quickly. I will make it active and I will exit and I will create a text file on it. 
Ah, God, I forgot to uh, assign a drive letter. That helps. Select volume one, assign, assign. Here we go. I will create a file on my C drive, uh, test.txt. So if I do a directory listing on my C drive, I have a single text file and I have about 127 gigs uh, of free space. But now I can create a VHD file here. So I can go back into this part and instead of creating a normal partition, I will create a virtual disk. So create VDisk and then I simply specify the file. my win8.vhd file and I specify the type it can either be fixed or expandable to save some space I will do expandable and I will specify the size 40 gigs and now I have a vhd file I can select it and I can format it, but before that I need to attach it. Now I can do a format, fs, ntfs, quick. I did select it. Still a beta, wasn't it? <laughs> hmm. Eh. This was funny. Win H V T. Let's do this. Detach it and attach it again. Uh, I have no idea right now why I can't format this one. Uh. That was the name of the file, right?
Hmm. Hmm. <sighs> I would guess this is way um a quick reboot. See if that helps. That's the benefit of doing a live demo. <laughs> Thank you, sir. The answer was right there from the audience. I heard it. I attached it, yeah, but I didn't create the partition. That's why it wasn't available for selection. That was a test, right? You know that. <laughs> All right. Let's try to do this again a bit more quickly this time. And I will now create the virtual disk again. Forty gigs in size. Expandable. <sighs> Select well one assign create V disk file equals Beautiful, we have the virtual disk. So let's select it. And let's actually go ahead, attach it, and create a partition. Format it. and exit. Now I will map myself back to the server again. And uh, I, I can I can feel I'm I'm among friends in this room so I can show you my super secret password. <laughs> which I apparently <laughs> typed <laughs> incorrect. Supposed to be a W in here somewhere. I'm getting blind here. Here we go. How difficult could that be? Go into the folder again. Uh, I will run setup once again.
my Windows 7 setup, which is 8. And now I have my new VHD file here. So I can now start my deployment into that file. And after 10 minutes, I will have this. This is Windows 8. My boot drive is my VHD file. My D drive is the file where I have added my text test file and the VHD. And you can see it's 40 gigs in size. That's one way of doing this. Another way of doing this is go to a deployment solution create a new sequence and actually select one of the ready-made deploy to VHD sequences that is available in NDT 2012. If I do that and select an operating system they will actually add in here the necessary steps to do what I did, but fully automated as part of your normal deployments. So pick one. Spend an hour in the command prompt typing wrong, or use a solution that will do this in the background. Your choice. Right. So, boot from VHD. All right. As I mentioned this morning when we started, or lunch it is actually, there are different passes that a setup is, is going through. So depending on what we do, we need to modify individual sections in the unattended XML file to make this happen. So the tool that we use to do this is the image manager. That's the authoring tool for the unattended XML files. And if I go to a Windows 7 machine where I have image manager installed, and that's part of ADK as well, or Windows Ike if you want to use that version, the downside of the developer preview of Windows 8, it's missing a catalog file. So you need to generate one first. So you need to select the Windows image. You need to find the installed WIM file so you can generate the catalog file. The catalog file is an index of the WIM file. When you have a catalog file, you can rather open a catalog file rather than opening a WIM file. Generating will take five minutes. Opening a catalog file, two seconds. But if I open up, an answer file. You can see the different sections here. And for example, this one is new. When you deploy Windows 8, by default, it will prompt you and say, hey, do you want to use a Windows Live ID for login? No, I do not. I would like to have my domain account, please. Thank you. You can just say true to this one to skip it. That's the only change you have to do in this XML file to have a fully automated uh, Windows deployment. You still need to add the product key, though, but this is what you need to add. Now, when you do, do deployments, currently today with Windows 7, you are hopefully using a solution to do that. So if you are a Microsoft customer, many of you will be using either MDT 2010 or 2012 or a Config Manager or any other tool behaving like those, solutions, 
Altiris and all those third-party things available to you. You normally do not add edit this file manually. What any and all solutions will do is, is three things. The deployment solutions, they will gather information about the machine you are about to deploy. This machine is supposed to join this domain. It's supposed to have this computer machine, uh, computer name, etc. It will read settings stored as variables. Then, no matter what deployment solution you have, they will normally copy a template. A template unattend XML file to the local machine. Then they have some sort of a routine. In the MDT world, it's called configure. This routine will update the local unattend XML file with the settings it read in the beginning. So there is normally a process reaching out, finding information. A template is copied down, and the template is updated. And then setup is run using that now updated template. So often, this is where you will modify the changes. You often do not have to modify the template. But if you do, if there are some specific settings you would like to have, well, for example, you just love the uh, first run wizard in IE, or not. You can disable that for everything. You can do that in your template. But normally you don't have to. But this is the utility used for authoring XML files. Right. And I have to tell you that driver's issues will not be changing with Windows 8. It will be about equally bad as it is in Windows 7. But like Windows 7, Windows 8 has a driver store. What's the point of a driver store? Why do we have one? XP doesn't. Windows 7 and Windows 8 does. Why do we have a driver store? What's the point? A nice folder? A driver store is the thing that allows us to have normal users on Windows 8 deploying devices that we as administrators, IT pros, have approved or rather staged drivers for into the driver store. So if I know that a machine is going to connect a printer or a scanner or a camera or a phone or something else to a machine, you can, as part of your deployment process, make sure that that driver is stored, staged into the store, into the driver store. And then when the user connects the, uh, his or her phone, for example, it will be installed happily. But it's not the user context anymore. It's the local plug and play service in Windows 8 that will do the deployment. So that allows you to have users being normal users and still be able to do deployments. This driver store can be updated online or offline. When we do deployments, we normally do it offline. We do it in the WinPE phase. The deployment solutions you are using, they normally do something like this. They boot into WinPE, they apply the image, but before rebooting into Windows, they will have a mechanism selecting drivers from a repository, copying them down locally and injecting them. MDT is using setup for this, config manager is using DISM, and most other utilities or solutions are using DISM as well. Crafting an unattended XML file with the driver to install, and they run DISM to install it. But this is in the background. All right. Like Windows 7, Windows 8 also requires uh, signed drivers at least for 64-bit systems. But you should also always be using signed drivers. 
because if you don't, they will come last in the ranking process when Windows is trying to figure out what drivers to actually use. What's another benefit of the driver store? Okay, we can now have standard users installing devices, cool. What more? What else? Well, since we have a store, it's a Windows component, and Windows components can be... Wrong one, sorry. <laughs> Managed through group policies. This has been available to you since Vista, but this is what you can do. Through group policies, you can manage the driver store. So you can either allow or prevent entire classes of devices. If you hate scanners, you can prevent scanners. But you can also do either allow or prevent individual devices. Meaning you as an IT organization or an organization with doing IT, you can have either white lists or black lists of devices that you support in your organization. And if a user tries to install it, you can display a custom message to them saying something, uh, you have been audited. Your manager has been sent an email. You might just as well pack your things together. No. But this is a better way. Rather than putting super glue into the USB ports to prevent people from getting data out of your systems, you can do this. You can have a policy preventing devices. All right. So what else about drivers? Well, what you will find out is that not all drivers are created equal. First, it's about finding them. So what drivers should you use for your Windows 8 deployment? How many vendors do you think will have ready-made Windows 8 drivers right this minute? when you start to play around with the developer preview. Like that many. Go for the Windows 7 driver. Hey, my man. Have you heard about deployment before? Never? It's new, yeah. Olav is one of the, uh, what do you call yourself, deployment ranger? Deploying Norway, was it? Yeah. He actually had a session on tech and named something like deploying Norway or... Yeah. Good one, though. Anyway, back to drivers. You should try to use the Windows 7 driver. It normally works fine in Windows 8 as well. If you can't find a Windows 7 driver, you cry a little bit, and then you try the Vista driver. It normally works, too. If you can't find a Vista driver, do not try an XP driver. It will not work. Except for one driver, and that's the VMware NIC driver for one of their guest OSs, one of their very old drivers. It happens to work in Windows 7 and Windows 8 too. But the reason we need those drivers, we, 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 you can find most of them right now directly on, on uh, uh, Microsoft Catalog site. So, uh, if I go to catalog Microsoft.com, if I have a internet connection, at a conference, try again. <coughs>
stop using your phones. have name resolution Dum 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 dum. I do not get an internet access right now. Use a hotspot. Which one? Hello, my friend. It's uh, it's thinking about accessing the wireless network. See if I can get an IP address on the wire here. The quickest way is actually doing a disable and an enable of the card. <coughs> Eventually. What I was about to show you is that on the catalog site, catalogupdatemicrosoft.com, you can actually search directly for the device names. And you can also search for, if you have a device, which is unknown, or unknown where you would like to have an update, you can actually go to that device, find the hardware ID, you can search for that hardware ID directly on catalog update uh, as well. If you can't find the drivers on the vendor site, which should be your starting point, the catalog site is a good second place uh, to look for drivers. Uh, the only downside is it does require internet connections, which I unfortunately don't have right now. So I simply I will skip that browsing process. All right. That was device drivers. Something I would like to end with is that Microsoft provides you with what they call a solution. It's not. It's tools. Like ADK, it's supposed to be used for plumbing the foundation of things. Windows Deployment Services will simply give you uh, the option of pixie booting your boot images that I showed you earlier and it also gives you the multicast support to be more effective in doing network deployments. But the thing is you're not supposed to use them as a deployment solution. You're supposed to be using tools like MDT, tools like Config Manager, tools like Altiris, tools like something else that in the background is using Windows Deployment Services to deploy the images. Because the only thing that Windows Deployment Services is good at, it's applying a static image. We don't live in a static world. We want more than image deployments. We want applications, we want settings, we want updates. And therefore, we don't use Windows Deployment Services as a solution. We use it as an enabler to get the boot images going. And then the solution takes over and do its uh, uh, deployment. All right. Uh, I was reminded to, um, I was reminded to remind you 
about finding uh, or filling in the eval forms, those different colored papers before you leave. So by that, uh, thank you for taking your time.